Marian Anderson, the poised, beautiful national treasure was one of the greatest voices of the 20th century. Her talent opened many doors for all black artists and performers. She was the voice of freedom that gracefully fought for equality. Marian Anderson was born February 27, 1897 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. As a child growing up in Philadelphia, Anderson was something of a legend. Her father, John Anderson, who had sold ice and coal, died in 1914 when she was 12. Her widowed mother, Anna Anderson, formerly a Virginia school teacher, reared Marion and her other two daughters amid great hardships. Anna and her three daughters moved in with John's parents while Anna found work cleaning, laundering, and scrubbing floors. There was always something both extraordinary and sad about young Anderson. She was large and awkward for her age. For as long as anyone could remember, the girl had sung in the Union Baptist Church Choir, demonstrating her vocal skills early by singing soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. She was nicknamed the Baby Contralto. During these early years, Philadelphia's black community, keenly interested in her future and determined that her voice be heard, took up a special fund at the church so she could have money for singing lessons. Even then, Marian Anderson must have realized the special responsibility she was saddled with. No success or failure she ever had would be simply hers alone. Already, she was a social symbol for the entire community that felt its destiny tied to hers. Soon, Black America pinned its hopes on Marian Anderson. Convinced, she would crack the walls of prejudice and become the first Black concert hall performer in American history to appear in big show places all over the world. When she was 15 years old, Marion began voice lessons with Mary Saunders Patterson, a prominent black soprano. Shortly thereafter, the Philadelphia Chorale Society held a benefit concert providing $500 for her to study two years with leading contralto Agnes Reef Snyder. Marion attended William Penn High School, focusing on commercial education to get a job until her music vocation arose. She transferred to South Philadelphia High School, focusing on music. She graduated at age 18. She then applied for admission to a local music school, but was coldly rejected because of her race. After she graduated from high school, her principal enabled her to meet Giuseppe Boghetti, a much sought after music teacher. When he heard Marion audition, singing Deep River, he was moved to tears. Marion's initial invitations grew to actual tours, focusing on black colleges and churches in the South. By 1921, Anderson was under the tutelage of Giuseppe Boghetti. He groomed her for a big musical competition which came at New York's Lewiston Stadium in 1926. Anderson won first prize over 300 other singers, after which she had a short engagement with the Philadelphia Orchestra, performed at Carnegie Hall, and won a Julius Rosenwald scholarship. She continued studying intensely, vigorously, with astounding reserve of discipline and stamina. Throughout the 30s, she toured Europe, singing German leader and spirituals. The reactions to this contralto were overwhelming. The roof of his house was too low for her, composer Jean Silibus told her. In Salzburg, Arturo Toscanini made the pronouncement that has never died. A voice like yours is only heard once in a hundred years. None understood her triumph abroad better than La Baker, who, upon meeting Anderson, bowed and curtsied, one diva in homage to another. Finally, impresario Sol Hurich brought her to town hall in 1935. The next year, her Carnegie Hall appearance was packed. She then returned to Europe, then back to the States, where in 1938 alone, she performed 70 recitals hitting cities all over the country, including the South, giving the longest, most intense tours in concert history. In time, Anderson probably also made more celebrated international tours than any other performer, traveling throughout Scandinavia, performing in all the great European capitals, as well as Japan, Mexico, South America, Africa, and the West Indies. Throughout the long, exhausting European tours of her early years, Marian Anderson may have struck many as a woman on the run, without a home. For the truth of the matter was that Marian Anderson, the greatest contralto of the 20th century, was neither fully recognized nor wanted in her own country. 
The great hurricane blew in at the tail end of the 30s. Anderson was scheduled to appear in Constitutional Hall, which was owned by the Daughters of the American Revolution. Playing on a hunch, a shrewd newspaper woman, Mary Johnson, called the DAR's president and asked what the organization position was. The position was clear. Neither Marion Anderson or any other Negro was going to appear in Constitutional Hall. Suddenly, through no design of her own, Marion Anderson was back in the newspaper headlines, this time around as the star of the biggest racial flap of the decade. Across the nation, blacks and liberal whites were enraged by the incident. Walter White, executive secretary of the NAACP, stepped in to suggest a way to best focus on the racism of the DAR by staging a large outdoor free concert in the nation's capital. Anderson agreed to the concert, although at the time she was so busy touring that the full impact of the situation had not hit her. A surge of publicity arose as Eleanor Roosevelt and Secretary of the Interior, Harold Akis agreed to sponsor the concert. Mrs. Roosevelt even resigned from the DAR in protest. Supreme Court Justice, Senators, congressmen, cabinet members, and other distinguished men and women announced their support of the event too. On Easter Sunday, 1939, the concert was held at Lincoln Memorial. 75,000 people attended. Marian Anderson opened with America and closed with Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen. Afterward, the enthusiastic crowd went wild, trying its best to get to the singer. For a few scary moments, it threatened to be a stampede. In the end, the event began a new era in the history of the fight for civil rights in America, and Marian Anderson became one of the most famous women in the world. The Lincoln Memorial Concert made her an international celebrity. Throughout the event and afterward, she remained a gracious, quietly commanding, but shadowy figure. No one can ever say exactly how she felt about any of the commotion, even years later when she did write about the concert in her autobiography, My Lord, What a Morning, her account was moving, but her gut feelings seemed politely veiled. What were my own feelings, she wrote in her response to the news of her rejection by the DAR? I was saddened and ashamed. I was sorry for the people who had precipitated in the affair. I felt the behavior stemmed from lack of understanding. They were not persecuting me personally, or as a representative of my people so much as they were doing something that was neither sensible nor good. Could I have eased the bitterness, I would have gladly done so. I do not mean that I would have been prepared to say that I was not entitled to appear in Constitutional Hall as might any other performer, but the unpleasantness disturbed me. And if it had been up to me alone, I would have sought a way to wipe it out. I have been in this world long enough to know that there are all kinds of people all suited by their own natures for different tasks. I would be fooling myself to think that I was meant to be a fearless fighter. What did emerge from Anderson's comments was almost a queenly air. She felt sorry for them. They had a lack of understanding. The unpleasantness disturbed her. Of the plans for the outdoor concert, she said, in principle, the idea was sound, but it could not be comfortable to me as an individual. As I thought further, I could see that my significance as an individual was small in the affair. I had become, whether I liked it or not, a symbol representing my people. I had to appear. The night before her concert, Marian Anderson could not find a hotel in Washington in which to stay. Yet throughout the entire affair, and for the duration of her career, she functioned by somehow miraculously detaching herself stoically accepting a symbolic role thrust on her because of her formidable talent and her color. In Europe, she was welcome into the finest hotels and restaurants, but in the U.S., she was shifted to third or fourth class accommodations. In the South, she often stayed with friends. Simple tasks such as arranging for laundry, taking a train, or eating at a restaurant were often very difficult. She would take meals in her room, and traveled in drawing rooms on night trains. She said, if I were inclined to be combative, I suppose I might insist on making an issue of these things, but that's not in my nature. And I always bear in mind that my mission is to leave behind me the kind of impression that will make it easier for those who follow. Early on, she insisted on vertical seating in segregated cities meaning black audience members would be allotted seats in all parts of the auditorium. 
Many times it was the first time blacks would sit in the orchestra section. By 1950, she would refuse to sing where the audience was segregated. During the Roosevelt Truman years, Anderson continued her record-breaking tours. She also became one of the most decorated women in the world, winning countless awards and citations from groups black and white. Finally, even Constitution Hall was open to her. But even with the new honors, her position as a black artist in America had not been greatly altered. Doors were still closed to her because of her race. It would be more than a decade before she would finally sing at the Metropolitan Opera House. When she commented on her country's racial attitudes or her own situation, Anderson was often gentler than other divas of her time and never defiantly critical. Anderson quietly supported many civil rights causes and also sang at the 1963 March on Washington where Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his I Have a Dream speech. In 1965, Marion gave her final performance at Carnegie Hall in New York. Afterward, she settled with her husband, Orpheus Fisher, on a farm in Connecticut. She died of congestive heart failure on April 8, 1993, at age 96. The following June, a memorial service attended by 2,000 admirers paid tribute to the singer whose beautiful voice exposed the country's ugly racial divisions. The singer who had once been barred from performing in the nation's capital, who had been forced to use the back entrance at posh hotels, had become an American musical icon. Of her awards and honors, in September 1958, she was made Goodwill Ambassador to United Nations. Anderson was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1963 by President Lyndon B. Johnson. And she was a recipient of numerous honorary degrees. She made farewell tours of the world in the United States in 1964 and 1965. In 1977, her 75th birthday was marked by a gala concert at Carnegie Hall. Among her myriad honors and awards were the National Medal of Arts in 1986, and she received a Grammy Award for Lifetime Achievement in 1991. If there is a tragic aspect to Marian Anderson's career, it is simply that later generations, black and white, will view her as something as a tattered social symbol rather than as the greatest contralto of the 20th century. Her position with its layers of meaning and the relentless flow of myth, legend, symbol, image, and a dream that swirled about it was a complex one. Yet she handled her situation with unending reserves of intelligence and poise. Anderson was iconic, a pioneer, a quiet champion for her people with a voice that moved hearers to tears and brought down barriers of division. Marian Anderson, Onyx Queen.
and God bless you all. If you enjoyed this video, please share, like, and subscribe to this channel. Thank you for watching.